You browse through Instagram or see or watch advert in a magazine or on TV or a review on YouTube and something happens. A watch leaps out the page or screen at us. There's a sound like a chorus of angels and a new quest has just been born at that very moment. A watch quest that may take many weeks or months or even years to fulfil. But what causes our jaw to drop and our hearts to skip a beat when we see a watch that we love? Because a watch that makes my heart skip a beat is different to one that will make yours do the same. A watch that shouts loudly enough for me to put my hand in my pocket and make a purchase won't be the same for you. And we've looked at thousands of watches in the recent past, but other watches didn't do this. Why not? What's going on in here and here that kickstarts a journey of research and budget assignment and hunting and buying and waiting and then waiting and then receiving and then falling in love. And then we do the entire thing all over again with a totally different style of watch. What just happened? Stay tuned and I'll tell you. If we're meeting for the first time, I'm Marcelo from Prestige Watches. I love talking about the business side of watches and even more than that, specifically, I love the marketing and psychological aspects around watches and watch brands and how they resonate with us collectors and enthusiasts. And in this video, I thought for fun, I'd add a little comparison to the feelings we get when we see someone and have an instant crush on them. So what's going on here? First of all, there's two things going on. Phase one, which is made up of two parts. And number one is the watch itself. The tangible elements of the watch, the design, which is the overall look, the, the color schemes. This is the first thing that draws us in. It instantly moves us. In fact, it more than moves us, it can shake our bones. It can cause us to gasp a little bit and our heart skips a beat. And this all happens in, in an instant. The processing of a hundred things the ticking of hundred little boxes in our semi-conscious minds. And the boxes that my brain ticks are totally different to the ones that yours will tick. And these general interests change. They change daily and weekly and, and monthly, from gold watches to two-tone watches to black PVD coated watches to our current interests and motivations of mountains or boardrooms, under the water or up in the air, rubber straps to metal straps, GMT complications or chronographs or moon phases, maybe thin watches or, or massive watches, salmon dials, panda dials or sporty watches or dressy watches or hybrids. The physical features of the watch is what first catch our eye and the ticking of these hundreds of little boxes. Now this needs to satisfy our own personal drivers and current search criteria and feature requirements. And this, in relationship terms, is like seeing that sexy person across the room that makes our eyes pop out of our faces and we can't stop looking at them across the room. Now part two of phase one is that we scan the details of the watch, the specifications. And this list of requirements is different for everyone. I might like 38mm watches, you might like 44mm watches. I might like dive watches, you might like pilot watches. I might like new cutting edge avant-garde watches. You might like vintage or vintage inspired ones. I might like adventure tool watches. You might like dress watches. And so the list goes on and on and on. But the design and the details need to be on point here so the watch floats our boat and tickles our pod and tickles our onions. If phase one of the launch sequence isn't activated, you won't get to phase two, which will lead to lift off. Now this part, in relationship terms, is like striking up the conversation with that sexy someone. You've had the initial love at first sight, the emotional explosion, where you ticked all the boxes for what appeals to you visually, the hair, the colour, the height, the dress sense, are they posh, are they casual, their stature, their shoe choice. Now we're in conversation mode. We've approached them, we've broken the silence and we've said hello. We're chatting and internally we're processing every step of the way. Do I like this person? Do I think they'll like me? Is there a spark of magic? Is it easy going or is it hard work? Does the conversation flow? Is the second step as good as the wow of the first impression expectations? And again, all of this is happening 
in an instant. Then we move on to phase two. Once we've checked all of the boxes of phase one, and this could literally only take a few seconds to process, our brains are pretty powerful lumps of matter. We then enter phase two, where we start thinking about, or obsessing, about how the watch would make us feel if we were to own it and to have it on our wrists. We visualize ourselves putting it on and wearing it to the pub to see our mates or out for a meal with the other half or driving in our car or walking down the street or out in the wilderness or having it as a travel companion on a plane or in a strange country. These thoughts can manifest in our conscious and subconscious thoughts for many weeks to the point where it becomes a mini obsession. Actually, it's a bit like we're falling in love with the watch because of how it could and would make us feel in the future, the excitement of it. Maybe it's a bit naughty, the forbidden fruit, you can't afford it and you know you can't afford it, but you're still interested in it anyway. Irrational processing in your mind where good gives in to evil. You can always sell it, you tell yourself. Actually, it'll make a good investment, you convince yourself. You can make money on it. You attempt to justify the purchase. And then there's the thrill of the hunt, the gamification of seeking and hunting, like a lion trying to outsmart the gazelle, outthinking and outperforming. You're looking for deals online, or you're speaking to your authorized dealers or people you know in the industry or on social media. You contact them, you negotiate, you negotiate some more. You get your feel-good hormones like dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin and endorphins, triggering emotions enough to deepen our connection with the watch in question and happily willing to spend our money. And these hormones have been fighting and overcoming our amygdala in an almighty battle of good versus evil. Now I'm gonna geek out a bit here. The amygdala is a region of our brain primarily associated with emotional processing. And a little fun fact, because if you know me, even a little bit, you'll know that I love psychology and business and the marketing side of watches and watch buying. So the amygdala is believed to have formed the core of a neural system for processing fearful and threatening stimuli, including detection of threat and activation of appropriate fear-related behaviors in response to threatening or dangerous stimuli. So when you're looking at a watch that is overpriced and you know you can't afford it, your amygdala is communicating with you to let you know that. So what's going on is that here we have the rational resistance versus the emotional pull, the battle between the, the heart and the, the head. And then there's a trophy of it all. And I'm not talking about the status trophy of a super high-end watch here, like a Rolex or an AP or a Patek, that many buyers wealth symbols or dollar bills on the wrist in an ostentatious and rather vulgar display of arrogance. Because what I'm talking about here is a watch enthusiast trophy that is awarded by the journey of acquiring a watch that is loved and respected a Seiko or an Amiga or Cartier or Panerai, and of course high horology, but for the right reasons, passion and genuine enjoyment, not status and wealth. And then of course we have sensation transference. I did an entire video on this and I'll put a link at the end of this video. The feelings of nostalgia, past memories, places and people and dreams of things to come, the places you wish to see, the things you wish to do, the person you wish to become. Sensation transference from watches, it's real, it, it exists and it's a powerful force. And we buy the watch. And in our relationship example, boom, we're engaged and then we're married. Next, we have the energy that is created from the purchase and the ownership of the watch. I spoke about this in other videos and I'll leave a link to them at the end. A new watch will go a long way in increasing self-esteem and providing a sense of belonging, a sense of accomplishment and achievement, rewarding ourselves for all of our hard work. It can motivate and inspire and remind us to perform at our best for ourselves and for our family. And again, this energy is real. We love the watch and we wear it constantly and we look at it with loving eyes. This is the honeymoon period that we all know and love so much. And in our relationship example, boom, we're making babies. Soon, our watch interests have and will change. We look at other watch styles, different things attract us. The watch sits in the watch box for longer than it used to. Then it comes out again and we love it. We rotate it with other watches. And in our relationship example, this is where we've been in a married relationship with our sexy someone for quite some time. We love, we argue, 
We've done loads of things together. We've traveled, we've moved house, we've endured and we've enjoyed. And finally, the last step of the process is that we own and we admire and we love and we cherish this watch. It survived being sold, it stayed with us and it will never leave us. And in the relationship example here, we're raising kids. Thanks for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and if you got some value from it. And while you're there, you might as well subscribe. Cheers, I appreciate you and I'll see you on the next one.